A few months back, I did a live stream where I did an unboxing of this printer right here, the Ender 3 Max. Now, the Ender 3 Max is a hybrid of an Ender 3 and an Ender 3 V2, but with a larger build volume, which is very appealing for folks that may want to print something like this helmet right here. Since then, I've had some questions. What do I think of this printer? Have I done any more printing on it? And that's what this video is right here. I'm actually going to be comparing this printer with a regular Ender 3 and an Ender 3 V2. I'm going to give you my thoughts on it and whether I think that this should be your first large format 3D printer. That's what I'm covering right here today on Curzy Fabrications. Let's go. So let's jump right into this video talking about the mechanical aspects of this printer and again comparing it to an Ender 3 or an Ender 3 V2. So the build volume here as you can see versus my standard Ender 3 over here which is you know pretty small. This is a standard 220 by 220 by 250 bed which is the same size on the Ender 3 V2 while this one over here has a 300 by 300 by 340 build volume which is a pretty good size as you can see i was able to print both this giant base mode print as well as this full size actually kind of oversized helmet here and um, it was able to hold all of this so if you're looking for a printer that can do all of that this would be what you'd have to go with over the ender 3 or the ender 3 v2 now the build surface on this printer is Crowdy's nice glass build surface, which I actually do really like. It has a texture on it that when it heats up, it holds onto the print really well. And when it cools down all the way, it releases very well also, which is the same build surface you'll find on the Ender 3 V2, but definitely not the plasticky sort of cheap build surface that you'll find on the standard Ender 3, which I've got sitting over here. Now mechanically, you're gonna see a lot of similarities between these two printers. They pretty much have the same form. They both have the power supply mounted on one side, the one Z screw on the other side, and let's go and comment on that. While some people are gonna complain that why aren't there two Z screws? Well, I can tell you this X gantry on this printer is a rock, it's solid. And that's coming from me who initially, when I pulled out of the box, said the same thing. I really can't wiggle this. I don't think I could tell any difference if it would have had that second Z screw due to the way that this mounting system works over here. If it's tensioned correctly, there's no give here and there really won't be anything for you to worry about. Moving on to the Y axis, they both have a single extrusion down the middle of the beds. Now, what you're gonna notice though is on a standard Ender 3, they have a 2040 extrusion that moves the bed while on the Ender 3 Max, you're going to see a 4040 extrusion, which is a absolutely terrific idea because it provides a lot more rigidity for the larger bed. So I really like that choice there. Now, while you'll notice that the extruders are almost identical on these two machines, the big upgrade on the Ender 3 Max is that it does come with an all metal extruder, which is a nice upgrade that you won't have to do later. And you won't have to worry about that extruder arm breaking on here. And just to verify that, I did do a little scraping on mine to make sure that there was metal on there, there and it absolutely was. So kudos to them for that upgrade. One more thing that you're gonna notice about the extruder that you see in this video is that mine is missing a filament runout sensor. Keep in mind that this is a beta unit that Crowdy sent me for evaluation. And when they sent it to me, it did not include the filament runout sensor, but the shipping units all have the filament runout sensor included which I'll go and tell you right now is an absolute must when printing on a printer this large, as you can see here with the uh, multiple filament swaps, it's absolutely necessary. So again, good on them for including that as a stock feature. Now, the other big upgrade I see on this machine mechanically is that I really like the hot end assembly on this machine over the majority of the stock Creality hot ends that you see. This one comes with the upgraded dual cooling extrusion setup, and that means you get cooling from both sides. That's going to save you a huge 
pain in the butt kind of upgrade in the future of installing an aftermarket fan system on there. Now, the fans on here aren't very powerful, but they are directed correctly. And from all of my testing, I saw no cooling issues on my helmet, on my Batman, on any of the tests that I ran. No cooling issues at all. So I was really happy to see that on this printer. And I hope that they do that upgrade in the future on pretty much all of their printers going forward. So other than that, these two machines are pretty much mechanically identical. So let's move on to the electrical systems. So one of the things I always look at when I get a new printer is I'll pop it open and find out what the main board is in that printer. Now this main board has the upgraded main board similar to what you're going to find in the Ender 3 V2. This is the 32-bit V4.2.2 main board and this one comes with the TMC 2208 silent steppers for silent movement of the printer. Now I'll go ahead and mention right here that while the motion on this machine was relatively silent, one thing that was not silent to me was the extruder itself, which you could hear the extrusions and retractions pretty easily. Now, it may be quieter than what you'd find if it was not using the silent steppers, but I did find that rather loud for a machine that has the 2208s built in. Again, if you're not familiar with this board, it uses a STM 32-bit base processor, and that is going to be running at 72 megahertz. Now again, comparing it to the stock Ender 3 as opposed to the Ender 3 V2, you're gonna find that this comes with the standard Marlin or 12864 display that is your character-based LCD display as opposed to your touchscreen. Now, me personally, I've always preferred this kind of interface. I find it very clean, I find it fairly easy to find what you're looking for, and I find it very reliable versus the touchscreen. So this is not a downgrade to me at all. But if you were looking for a touchscreen interface, you're gonna have to go with something like the V2 or look for something aftermarket. But again, I really like this on this machine and all of the features using their stock firmware that's available on their website worked just fine for me. I had no problems with the display operation at all. I did have a problem for some reason, wiring or whatever, with some noise on this display where every now and then with a really long print, the display would go out on me. I'd get garbage on the display. I don't know what the cause of that was. Usually it's electrical noise. I unplugged it, plugged it back in while it was printing. That didn't seem to fix the problem. Again, I'm not quite sure what the issue there is. I haven't seen anyone else reporting it, but again, I wanted to tell you my experience with it, and that's something that I ran into. Continuing with the electrical system, this one does come with an upgraded Meanwell 350 watt power supply stock, while the Ender 3 and some of the other less expensive ones do come with the Chang Lang power supply as its standard option, so this was a welcome upgrade. Now, the only thing that I really did not understand with their power supply setup, though, was you can kind of stick your fingers underneath the bottom of this power supply. It's open, which is a kind of a big shocking hazard, given that this has mains voltage going to it. And I really don't understand why they left it that way. I couldn't find any electrical or even an airflow reason. Maybe that's what they were going for. But... Uh, they really shouldn't have done that. They should have come up with a better solution, even if they would have put slits underneath there. Now, they do have a nice shock hazard sticker on here that should, I guess, alert you that you shouldn't put your fingers under there. But uh, it's definitely a problem, and I wanted to mention that to you. If there's some available aftermarket 3D printable covers for this, you probably should do that to prevent yourself from potentially getting a nasty shock from mains voltage. Continuing with the safety of the electrical system, there's a few things I wanted to mention. First of all, I really like the included strain relief on the bed. I think it is a very good attempt to make sure that we don't have any breakages or disconnections there. Moving down the electrical system, looking at the rest of the wiring, they actually have a, an authentic XT60 connector that runs from the power supply to the main board, and that XT60 connector is soldered on properly. Looking at all the connections on the main board, which I did in my live stream, they were all connected well. The wire management is done correctly. Again, in traditional fashion, for most of these printers I'm seeing this day, they are still tinning the ends of those electrical wires going into the main board, which they should not be doing. They should either be using ferrules, which is preferred, or just leaving it untinned. But 
carefully inserted in there so you don't have any stray wiring. So again, just to be thorough, I wanted to include that information right here. So let's talk about the price of the printer real quick. So from Creality's website, this is running a retail price of $329 versus this guy, which is $179 versus the Ender 3 V2, which is $262. So this one's definitely an upgrade on price versus either of the other two models. But given the fact that you've got a bigger bed, you've got an upgraded power supply, you have an updated main board, and you've got some updated hardware in your construction, including the dual fans here, as well as the larger 4040 extrusion in the middle, I do see where the extra money is going. And when comparing this versus the rest of their line of printers, the only thing I really found it in line with was the CR10, which you can find on sale for $299. But keep in mind, that's the original CR10, no upgrades, no extra size. That's not the 400, that's not the 500. Um, so that's definitely an older model. It's gonna have less features than this one does and is going to require more upgrading than this one does. So just looking at the Creality line alone, I think this one's priced really well because it's taking a lot of their newer features, putting it into a new model of printer and giving you more space to print. So from a price perspective, I think it's a really good deal given all you're getting for your extra money. Now looking at the construction process of the printer right out of the box, you can follow along with what I did in my Ender 3 Max live stream, which I've included links to in the description. But I did find the construction process fairly simple and straightforward. Now, of course, I've built a lot of these, but one thing that Creality gets right is that the instructions in their manual are in color, they're easy to follow, and I really didn't have any problems following the instructions to get this one put together. Overall, I found the construction very easy as long as I took my time. Now, anytime you're building a printer like this, it is up to you to follow best building practices. Make sure you get your extrusion square. Make sure you don't cross thread your screws. When you're putting things together, keep the screws loose until you are ready to tighten everything down and make sure it's built as good as possible. Also note, anytime you have wheels on a printer, make sure you check out that eccentric nut tightening techniques to make sure that it's not too tight and it's not too loose. Uh, there should be some other videos available online, or if not, if you'd like to see a video on that from me, how to properly tension these wheels, please leave me a comment down below and I will take a look at doing that. Again though, process was very easy, was able to get it together without any issues. So now it's time for the part of the video that most of you've been waiting on, and that are the test prints. Let's take a look at what this printer can actually do. Now, I'm gonna say right off the get-go that all of this was done with Creality Slicer. It's the slicer that comes with the printer. It has all of the settings and profiles that you need for most of Creality printers built right into it, and so that's what I went with. Now, keep in mind, it's just a customized version of a slightly old version of Cura, so if you're familiar with Cura, this all should look very normal to you. So first of all, with the profile for the Ender 3 Max, now it did not come with a profile for the Ender 3 Max, but it did have a profile for the standard Ender 3 and its variety. So I just took that profile, changed the bed dimensions, and I was ready to go on this printer. So let's start out with the calibration cubes that I run on most of my printers. And I've got my micrometer here, which I'm actually gonna take a look at how this actually did. So first of all, on the x-axis, I was able to get 19.8, 19.8, 19.8, yep. So it's about 19.8, 19.9 on the x. On the y-axis, I'm getting 20.0, 20 is a 19.9, 19.95. So these are very accurate on the Y. And on the Z axis, I am getting, so I'm taking multiple measurements here to make sure that I'm as accurate as possible. I'm getting actually 18.9, 18.9, 18.9, 18.9. So not doing so great on the Z axis. And when I saw that, I went and tried to figure out why that was. And I'm actually seeing some squishing 
at the very bottom of the print on the first few layers. Now, it's not really elephant footing in terms of the fact that I'm too close to the bed or anything like that. It just looks like for some reason it's squishing the bottom few layers of this print. Not really sure about why it's doing that. Um, and I guess we could take a look at some of the other prints here to see if it's doing the same thing. But I'm getting definitely a little bit of squishing on the Z axis, about a millimeter on here, and then it looks just fine. So let's move on to my first big print quality test, and that's going to be the Batman that almost everyone on this channel is going to be very familiar with. Now this Batman I used to test out the performance of the main board. I sliced this to see how well it handles these extreme curves, which are going to be sliced into some very small pieces of G-code in order to be able to print. I see absolutely no issues of jerking or stuttering or anything like that. The 32-bit mainboard is keeping up extremely well. I uh, don't see any issues really except a little bit of banding in the Z direction. Do I see that same issue near the bottom of the print that I was seeing on the cubes? It actually does look like I'm still seeing that bottom issue. And again, whether that is too much heat on the heat bed, not enough cooling on the bottom layers. I'm still hoping there's some tweaking that could be done, but I didn't really start noticing that until I printed out these cubes, which I actually did at the end. Um, but other than that, the print looks pretty good. It's not an exceptional print. Again, the 32-bit processor is doing really well, but the layer inconsistency is not... It's not the best layer quality I've ever seen on a printer. So let's move on to my next test prints, which is again an actual test of how mechanically well the printer does. And I went for my Maker's Muse tolerance test, which you've seen me run here on the printer before. Now with this one, I had some problems, which is why I have three copies of this. So with the first one, I printed all stock settings in the slicer. And as you can see, I was able to get 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, but from that point, those bottom layers are completely fused. The 0.2 wouldn't move, and obviously the 0.15 would not move. And even my center one, which I don't actually know what the tolerance is on the center one. Well, maybe, oh, okay, so if I, if I wiggle it just right, I can get that to, to move, but uh, I really had some issues on this. And Usually I can get most printers to handle that 0.2 tolerance with just a little bit of tuning. So I did that. And since I saw all of the issues on those bottom layers, which again is probably the same issues I was seeing on these other prints with the squishing, I went ahead, I tried one on a raft because that should get rid of those bottom layers really being an issue. And I found again with at least the default settings that are in the Creality Slicer, that bottom raft completely fused to this, meaning I couldn't test out any of the tolerance sizes. So this was fused, I'm assuming again, that same issue, not enough cooling, maybe the bed's too hot, again, whatever the case may be, but this wasn't good at all. <laughs> Tried one more where I backed off on the flow a little bit, made sure I wasn't printing too close to the bed, and on the bottom of this one, it looks better. That center one spins a lot easier, but still 0.2 was stuck for me. And uh, I wasn't able to go 0.15, obviously. So that's it for the tolerance test. Not as good as I was hoping for on this printer, but again, seeing that same issue with either cooling or heating on those bottom layers, causing uh, those bottom layers to stick too well together. So the last, two regular prints I did were these two vase mode prints. Now, this was the print that I tried to do during my live stream. This is a very small, simple vase mode print, and it would not print during the live stream. And Scott Latine, who is the author of Marlin, the main author of Marlin, joined us and told me that it's probably just that they've got the power save feature on. Basically, if the power goes out, it will be able to recover after the power fail, which the way they do that is just continuing to write to the SD card through the entire print at every layer change and then picks up from there. So that doesn't work very well though when you are layer changing 
constantly in a base mode. So you need to run the M413S0 command, put that in your start G code if you're going to be running any sort of base mode print. But again, I did want to show that it was possible to do, so I've got my very beginning base mode print here, very small, but quality exceptional on this. I don't see any of the banding that I saw on the Batman, and yeah, this one printed really, really well. And then I went with this one. This was one I found on Thingiverse. This is a beautiful vase, by the way. It looks like ribbon candy. And I wanted to basically do a full print volume size, at least in the Z direction, to see what sort of issues I had. Now keep in mind, I chose a vase that would be relatively stable while it was printing because I didn't want the geometry of the vase to cause issues. But anyway, as I printed this up, as you can see, it made it the whole way through without any issues. But the further I went up in this print, the more I saw Z banding. Now again, whether that Z banding is from the motion of the bed, whether it's from the nozzle, or whether it's from the actual moving of this model while it was printing, Obviously, I can't tell you. It may be a combination of several of those. Obviously, this is a moving bed printer. It's like not like my Ender 5 Plus or my Ender 6 or my regular Ender 5, which the bed only moves up and down. So you're going to see some of that artifacting, and you're going to see it even more if the uh, print itself is rather thin-walled. So again, other than that, print looks really well. The extrusions um, look overall very clean on here without any problems. So... My final test print, I had to print a helmet on here because I think anyone buying a printer in this particular size might be doing this with it because it's honestly a very good uh, size printer for something like this. As you can see, this is a pretty oversized helmet, but this is the size I had to print it with in order to fit it on my head given the way that the back opens. This is the Deathstroke Samurai helmet from Nico Industries, and obviously links down in the description if you want to purchase this helmet model. But it is a absolutely gorgeous model, lots of details, and I wanted to see just how well it did. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this one required me to manually swap the filament as I ran out, and that presented some problems. As you see, I did another video on what do you do when this process fails or what do you do when your filament gets clogged and I use this very helmet. But nonetheless, that's where I come in to what I said about mine not coming with the filament runout sensor but the shipping unit actually having the filament runout sensor which is a must with a printer this big because this was just at a kilogram I think and so since I started with some not completely full uh, filament spools I ended up having to swap there. But my overall thoughts on the quality here. So at the lower layers in particular, the quality on this is very good. I had no problems really removing any of my support structures that were under here. But the further I go up this helmet, once I get probably about halfway up the helmet, maybe a little bit below halfway, I do start seeing some more banding issues. There's some around the nose area. There's some weird ones that are pretty pronounced up in this area. Um, and I think that's about all I see. Obviously, the yellow part was the dome that I had to come back and add later. This is not something that's beyond cleaning up. I do plan on finishing this to some extent. But overall, same sort of banding issues. I've seen it here. I saw it on Batman. I saw it on the vase mode. And I definitely think that that's a factor of the moving bed. So all of these tests were done at about 50 millimeters per second, and I've got a couple of notes on that in particular. First of all, I did try to print this helmet faster. I tried to go at 80 millimeters per second, and that was the only failure I had on all of my testing. But as you can see, I had a big failure at this part. I started getting layer shifts printing inconsistently and just did not want to print that fast. Now in retrospect I probably could have upped the temperature on the filament even more and tried to print with a much higher uh, temperature on the filament but I don't typically find that that's necessary on 80 millimeter per second prints. That's not particularly fast but as you can see not only was I getting the 
issues with extrusion, but I was also getting the shift layers, which means that the bed wouldn't have really wanted me to do that anyway, because again, if you're getting layer shifts, that's not related to the extrusion process. The other thing I wanted to mention, the extruder. The extruder on this printer gave me problems pretty much the entire time I was testing. It would constantly skip, and it did not matter if I increased the temperature of the filament, because I tried that, it did not matter if I increased the voltage on the stepper. I tried that too, which I'm hopefully showing you here on the screen where I actually attempted that. Bringing it up to the highest voltage I found on any of the steppers uh, because I didn't want to overvolt that stepper driver. But none of that seemed to help with the extrusion. I constantly got clicking out of this extruder when printing pretty much anything that had longer extrusion paths. So the helmet, the larger of the two vase modes, even the Batman in certain places, anytime where I had a long path where it would get up to speed, I had extrusion clicking. Now, the only thing I can say about that is that I don't see artifacting from any of my prints that it was actually skipping, which I find kind of odd. But one of my biggest annoyances is definitely when the extruder will not put out the proper amount of filament and it clicks the entire time. Again, I tried time and time again to fix it on this one, but it is a big problem for me. My best guess on why that's not working properly is that that 2208 stepper is just not powerful enough to push it out using the, the way that this is designed mechanically. So unfortunately, I had to deal with that throughout my prints. It wasn't constant, I didn't hear it all the time but I heard it way too often and I did try to fix it. So those are my test prints. Let's move on to my final thoughts on this printer. So let me give you my final thoughts on this printer and tell you what I think about it overall. So first of all, I want you to keep in mind that Creality did send me this printer for evaluation and when they send it to me, that it is a beta unit. Now, that means that some of the things that I reviewed here could be slightly different from the shipping unit, and when possible, I did already share those with you throughout the review. So, first of all, the upgrades of this machine are absolutely fantastic, definitely over the Ender 3 and even over the Ender 3 V2. I would say that I like the upgrades provided here even better. So between the power supply, the nicer hot end with the dual cooling, the all metal extruder, the larger Y access extrusion, these are all terrific things that the printer comes with that you won't have to be fiddling with later to upgrade. And also the display, I, again, I like the character display that comes on here versus even worrying about a touchscreen display, which I don't actually think provides that much value. So as I showed, the printer is capable of printing some larger items such as the vase here or even full size helmets. But keep in mind, you're gonna to have to still go reasonably slow on this printer, probably in the 50 millimeter per second range. And of course that comes down to some of the inconsistencies that I was able to show with the moving bed, as well as the issues that I shared about the skipping in the extruder. You're definitely not gonna be able to push that filament any faster than the extruder is going to allow you to do. Looking at the price of the printer at $329, I think it's an excellent price for everything you're getting here. Just looking at the upgrades provided over a standard Ender 3 or an Ender 3 V2, comparing that to a CR10 original price, which like I said, could be had for about $299 now, I think that this is at a very good price point. Now, I do think that there are going to be some other competing products from other manufacturers that are going to be around the same size, price point, etc. that will be decent options. Now, I don't have any that come to mind right now because, again, I haven't tested a whole lot of printers specifically in this size or price range. So be sure to be on the lookout for other competitors and see what is available at the time. But again, as far as Creality is concerned, I think the $329 price is right about where it should be looking at the rest of their product line. So now down to the big question, would I buy this myself as a first large format 3D printer or maybe even a third large format 3D printer if you're looking to add an extra printer to your setup? 
Now, that's kind of a mixed bag to me. Number one, as I pointed out, this already has a lot of upgrades on it. So as far as the upgrade path is concerned, you're already further down the road than you would be on a whole lot of other printers. But there are a couple of things that keep me from giving this a high recommendation. Obviously, the first one is the skipping extruder. I could not put up with that any length of time, which would require me to almost immediately replace this main board with a main board with programmable stepper drivers, one that have the UART mode. And a lot of big tree tech boards provide that. Now, that would allow me to change the current going to the steppers when I need to. It would allow me to turn off things like silent step if I need to. That would definitely get me the current that I need to this main board. Now, keep in mind, that's adding extra expense to a printer that you've already spent $330 on. Now, that puts you into the upper 300s for this printer, just fixing that one issue. And the problem is, of course, once you've done that upgrade, now you have some other competing printers that you could take a look at. So that would be kind of my thought process when I'm thinking about an Ender 3 Max as my next printer. So keep that in mind. That's what I'm gonna be doing to this one. I'm gonna upgrade the main board to try to make it a little bit more useful to me. So to wrap this up, I hope that this was everything that you needed to make your decision about this printer. But obviously, this is one specific printer in one specific garage and if you have any questions or want to see some other thoughts on this printer there are some other terrific youtubers that have covered it so be sure to take a look at theirs so to wrap this up thank you very much for watching this video and thank you to all of my patreon supporters who have so graciously decided to support this channel month to month with my reviews my mods and some other upcoming new things that are coming to this channel these folks over here have been absolutely fantastic month after month. My Patreon sponsorship is growing. So if you would like to help out this channel on a monthly basis to keep it going, please think of contributing to my Patreon, which obviously the links are to in the description. If Patreon's not your thing, you can also check out PayPal and there's a PayPal me link in the description. Again, if you are not into contributing or you can't do that right now, no problem at all. I provide all of this free to you here on YouTube and it will always remain that way. And the best thing that you can do for me is hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. And click the little bell icon if you would like to get all of my updates. And again, thanks for watching. I am Chris and this has been Kersey Fabrications. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time.